All right. Uh, greetings to our uh, viewers in uh, New York, and greetings to our visitors here in Washington, D.C., at the law firm of Ballard Spar. I'm uh, Ron Collins, the co-chair of the First Amendment Salons, along with my colleague Lee Levine uh, and David Scover, who's in Seattle uh, right now. And I'm pleased to say that this is the 18th First Amendment Salon that we've had, dating back to April of, 19, of 2014, excuse me. And the, uh, the First Amendment Salons are really a series of programs uh, designed to emulate the Madisonian guarantee, the idea of uninhibited and robust and civil uh, discussion uh, on a variety of First Amendment topics, all having to do with freedom of speech, freedom of press, and freedom of assembly. Uh, to that end, uh, the salons engage members of the First Amendment community, be they journalists, professors, activists, or practicing lawyers. And the idea is to engage them in an ongoing discussion about uh, some of the key free speech issues of our time. And in that regard, we are delighted to have Ballard Spar as our sponsor, uh, the firm that makes <coughs> these salons possible and uh, we are in good hands uh, with them, and we want to thank again everybody at this firm for making the salons possible. Today's salon will consist of my interview uh, with the former Solicitor General of the United States, Mr. Donald Borelli. Uh, we'll begin with my uh, interview, and then we'll turn it over uh, to the audience in New York and here uh, for your questions. So, we invite you to participate in this uh, First Amendment activity and uh, engage with us in discourse uh, following my uh, interview. Now, let me start off by saying a few words about Donald Varelli. And first of all, thank you, uh, uh, General Varelli, for joining us today. We're so delighted and honored that you took time to be with us, and we very much appreciate oh, it. Delighted to be here. Um, uh, Mr. Varelli is a partner at Munger Tolls and Olson, and he's the founder of their Washington, D.C. office. Uh, he has argued a number of cases before the Supreme Court. Unless I'm mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, between 2011 and 2016, you argued 43 cases before the Supreme Court? Mm, that's or, a little high. Well, I, I, <laughs> according, 39 or 40, according to oh yes, uh, which uh, uh, okay. uh, uh, they've listed 43 cases. But somewhere around I, there. I okay. will, uh, he's, in, uh, he's argued a number of cases, somewhere between four, uh, 39 and 43. Uh, Mr. Borelli was Solicitor General between um, June uh, 2011 and June 2016. And uh, he also served as a legal advisor to President Barack Obama. And he served as the Associate Deputy Attorney General of the United States. Uh, his, uh, some of his landmark uh, victories include his advocacy in defense of the Affordable Care Act, and he successfully argued for marriage equality in two cases, Obergefell versus Hodges and United States versus Windsor. Uh, in addition to that, he's done a number of cases involving before the court involving antitrust, copyright, telecommunications, environmental law, due process, equal protection, a variety of uh, statutory uh, claims as well. Finally, and we're pleased to say that uh, he has taught uh, First Amendment laws for many years at Georgetown uh, University Law Center. Uh, law Center. So again, thank you very much for joining us today. And if I may take the liberty to begin with a very theoretical question, uh, the kind that law professors are known uh, to ask. So if you'll just indulge me, I'd appreciate it. And I apologize if it's a bit abstract. Um, can a sitting president be criminally indicted? <laughs> <laughs> So maybe. <laughs> maybe. No, 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 no. I'm the professor. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. It depends. But actually, in all seriousness, uh, I just want to thank everybody for making the uh, time to uh, spend their evening here doing this. I really appreciate it in New York and here in D.C., so thank you very much. And uh, what's your next question? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, uh, I take it we'll defer on that one. Is that correct? All right. Well, uh, let me ask you uh, uh, an easier question then. Uh, in June of 2016, uh, when you announced you were stepping down as Solicitor General, Nina Totenberg uh, stated the following. Initially, his style was low-key, seeking to have a conversation with the justices. But after a year on the job, he decided he was being too deferential and had to be effective. He had to confront the justices more directly during oral arguments. 
The somewhat more aggressive style helped him win many important victories for the administration. Was Nita Totenberg correct? Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if she was correct about the helped helped him win. Part. <laughs> you know, it had nothing to do with it. it. Made me feel a little better. Uh, but this is something actually that Paul and I talked about at the time. Um, in that I did start. I mean, essentially, I think she captured something accurate and and was conscious on my part that um, at the start of my tenure, I was um, in a much more kind of deferential mode in terms of argument with the justices, and um, I uh, and I felt that it did not work to my benefit. Um, the and, and I it, it was in a way a deliberate choice because as an advocate before the court and in, in, in general in private practice before going into government, I was a pretty aggressive oral advocate, and I thought that that style wasn't going to work well as SG, so I made a conscious choice to dial back. And I dialed the back, I dialed too far back, uh, I think, essentially. And, you know, and in part that's because, you know, and I, as it dawned on me over the course of the first year that that was true, and I got good advice from Paul on this. Uh, no, that's up Paul Smith, yeah, for the Paul record. Smith, right. Smith, yeah, we did. We talked about this very thing, and he, Paul gave very good advice about it. And part of the thing is that one of the things is when you're Solicitor General, of course, well, you're Solicitor General, and it's all this dignity supposedly surrounds it. On the other hand, you're arguing the most important cases, and you're arguing the most important cases at a time when there's a lot of ideological conflict, and therefore the bench, it tends to be very hot in those cases. And if the bench is hot and you're not, you it's you get back on your heels too quickly. And so, and you stay back on your heels. And so um, I felt like I needed to dial up in order to uh, maintain some more semblance of control over the argument and get my points out. And it was a long-term Project. I felt like actually, it's, you know, I was lucky. I got to do the job five years, which is longer than most people get to do it. I felt like by my fourth year, I got the dial to the right place. Um, <laughs> you know, second and third year, I was still kind of fiddling with the dial, but by my fourth year, I got the dial to the right place. I thought and was arguing it in the right way, respectful but aggressive. And you know, if I got if I, if I got pushed, I pushed back. Um, and uh, you know, was willing to sometimes take pretty sharp issue with justices uh, in particular situations. And so the last two years, I felt like I was I had gotten it right. But it took it didn't take me that long to really feel like I had the dial in the right place. Well, it, there are a number of Supreme Court advocates here and in, in New York City. I'm curious from your point of view, uh, what are some of the do's and don'ts of, uh, for a Supreme Court advocate in your view? Yeah, well, um, so... Uh, you know, I could go on all day about that, I suppose. Uh, well, let, let's make but, it a little shorter than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, in terms of do's and don'ts, the, the I guess the number one do is uh, answer the question, and the number one don't is evade the question, uh, <laughs> because they just in there and very, you know, they're gonna they're they're really smart and they're really well prepared and they ask really tough questions and you need to be able to grapple with them, and you and to if you try to evade rather than grapple with the questions you're being asked, you just get yourself in more trouble. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think so that so that's part of it. The other the, the other the other really important part of it, given how hot the bench is, is learning to speak in phrases as opposed to sentences and. Instead of you know you know the answers are you know a good answer is yes because X or no but Y you know they're not they're not complete sentences mm -hmm. um, and to the extent you even try to construct complete sentences as the first part of your answer very often you 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 can't get it out so you know, get your point out in phrases make space and then keep talking uh, but so I guess it would be those two things you know be direct uh, be forthright uh, and be succinct. I want to ask you, you clerk for um, Justice um, William Brennan in yep. the United States Reform, the Supreme Court, and before that uh, for Skelly Wright. Is that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. So I want to ask you about two cases uh, when you were a law clerk, um, I believe, uh, uh, in 1984, 85 term, mm -hmm. and contrast them with two cases that you argued when you were a Solicitor General. Okay. And see how. So if we go back in time to 1985, the United States Supreme Court, when you were a law clerk to Justice Brennan, decided a case called NAACP 
versus Hampton County Election Commission. And uh, there the court, by a nine-zip uh, uh, margin, held that Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act required that changes in election practices involved there had to be cleared by the Attorney General uh, prior to their implementation. Fast forward to 2013, you represented the United States government in Shelby County versus Holder, and there the majority, a divided majority, held that Section 4B of the Voting Rights Act was unconstitutional. In your opinion, uh, how did the basic conception of the Voting Rights Act change, if at all, between the Burger Court's opinion in 1985 and the Robert Court's opinion in 2013? So the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and in particular Section 5 or Section 4B and Section 5 together, um, those were that was an iconic statute in American history. It was a vitally important statute. I mean, many people here, I'm sure, remember President Johnson's speech urging the Congress to enact uh, that bill into law, where he finished with "We shall overcome," uh, and uh, that statute really had iconic status. And I think in 1985, that e even though it was a period in which a lot of the basic commitments of the civil rights era, legal commitments of the civil rights era, were starting to be called into question, uh, and called into question in litigation and, and by thinkers, uh, conservative thinkers and academics, that the statute still commanded enormous, enormous respect. By 2013, uh, when Shelby County was up there, that just wasn't true anymore. Uh, it was true for a part of the population and a part of the legal um, academy and a part of the judiciary, but it was not nearly as pervasively true as it was. And, and then, so as a result of that, I think the passage of time created space to challenge the law in a way that just I don't think was realistic uh, for people who might have wanted to challenge it in the 1980s. Uh, and, uh, and so as a result, you ended up with the 5-4 the decision that you did. Right? I want to do two other cases. Again, one from 1985, a divided court. We had decided a case called FEC versus National Conservative PAC. There, the court struck down the expenditure prohibitions of the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971 that barred independent uh, political action committees from contributing more than $1,000 to any given presidential candidate in support of a campaign. Contrast that case, FEC versus National Conservative PAC, with the case you argued in 2015, McCutcheon versus Federal Election Commission, wherein the court, a divided court struck down the aggregate limit section of the Bipartisan uh, Campaign Reform Act that restricted how much money a donor could contribute to uh, candidates for federal office, political parties, or political action committees. My question to you is, how, in your opinion, did those two cases expand, if at all, uh, the reach of Buckley versus Vallejo? And if so, what is your sense of that expansion of First Amendment law? I can see the theme of tonight's discussion, actually. You're going to take every case I lost by four. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So, um, the, Long conversation. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was Paul Smith who said that. <laughs> Paul M. Smith, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I'm... Uh, embarrassed to say, I don't remember the details of the 1985 case especially mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit hard for me to contrast the two, but I can talk at some length about McCutcheon. Okay. Um, which I'm happy to. You know, I do think that, you know, a couple of things about McCutcheon that were significant. One is it did overrule a part of Buckley. Um, and now it was a part of Buckley that had been criticized as being weakly reasoned, but it had overruled uh, part of Buckley. Buckley had upheld the provision of the statute that uh, was struck down in McCutcheon, um, uh, for one. Uh, another thing I thought that was quite striking about arguing McCutcheon was that um, the kinds of arguments that I was pressing in, in support of the statute, arguments that were focused on the reality of the risk. McCutcheon was a case about uh, bundling limits on the, a number of individual contributions one person could bundle together and give. Uh, on the basically the theory being, look, you you may not be able to win 
uh, undue influence with, with any one candidate by just giving that candidate the maximum allowed. But if you give 220 candidates the maximum allowed, you're going to have a lot of clout. Uh, and that, the, that sort of was the essential theory behind the limit on how many the aggregate contributions you could give. One thing I found really striking in the oral argument in that case was the incredulity with which the point I just made was met by some of the justices, that, I, that the just the absolute unwillingness, and I, I don't think it was cynical, I think it was genuine on their part, the absolute unwillingness to believe, A, that, that anyone would think to engage in this behavior. Why would anyone even think to do that, to bundle up contributions for 200 plus people and do them all at once? Or B, that it would result in that person having the kind of undue influence and creating the kind of implicit risk of a quid pro quo that the statute's trying to regulate. When, in fact, you know, it, it was obvious that it was going to happen the minute the thing was struck down, and it, it, it happened, it, and this is exactly what happened. There's been an explosion of that kind of giving. There were many, many people who gave right up to that limit um, before it was struck down, and once it was struck down, of course, was, uh, people did it all the time. And so I, I found that to be quite striking. And to me, that as much as anything else was a harbinger about where we're going on uh, questions of the First Amendment and campaign finance regulation in that that one, the thing about McCutcheon that was the, it, it's, it was a step that was different, even, you know, people got very strong feelings about Citizens United, but Citizens United at least was about expenditures. And McCutcheon was about contributions. And it was the willingness of the court to call contribution, now aggregate, not individual, but to call contribution limits into question and to strike down contribution limits. Uh, and as I said, based at least to my mind on uh, their own in instincts rather than any real sense about how the world would work um, in the absence of a limit like that, it made me think that over time, that contribution limits are, are really are in the crosshairs. And well, which brings me to my next question. So, um, what is your view of the quid pro quo uh, doctrine as articulated by the majority in the McCutcheon case? So, this is just me talking here, not the United States, right? You understand. But, okay, it's just me talking. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, to me, the idea behind these laws. Uh, it's not. It's, a, it's in part about the quid pro quo in the narrow sense that the McCutcheon court identified it, that it's got to be essentially the equivalent of a bribe or something that uh, or looks pretty darn close to a bribe. But you know what these laws are really about, to me, is preserving the public's confidence in the integrity of the electoral system. Um, and that the, as much as anything else, what these laws are designed to do is to give the public some faith that the whole that the system's on the level. Do you think not. this doctrine does that? There, the court's doctrine. No, I think that's that's what I find troubling about it. That I, you know, the concern I have about it is that, to the extent you find the only legitimate government interest here <coughs> being the interest that McCutcheon described, that very narrowly focused quid pro quo, kind of interest being the only interest that you'd be willing to recognize as compelling. You're you're really taking off the table the ability of Congress to make judgments that the public's faith in the system is at risk and that that needs to be addressed. Now, having said that, I realize that laws that purport to address that risk have to be scrutinized to make sure that they're not really just incumbent protection devices. You know, there's always going to be a motivation on the part of legislators to protect their interests. And so not saying that scrutiny of these laws is unwarranted. But I do think that, that by narrowing the view of what counts as a compelling interest to justify regulation in this area. The court is missing something that's very important, and I do think you, you see it manifest itself now in the public's cynicism about the processes of government. Um, you know, it's worsening and deepening, and I think decisions like, I mean, everybody's focused on Citizens United, but I think this basic idea that, well, there really isn't anything the government can do, really, apart from policing bribery or something just a little bit broader than bribery, uh, to preserve the integrity of the, of the democratic process, is, I just think that's really a problem. I'd like to ask you uh, about uh, a five to four case that somebody else lost. 
Yeah. Okay with that? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> it was decided, <laughs> decided last term, Janus versus Ashton. Oh, well, no, that's the same thing. Because, of course, I lost Harris five to four. <laughs> and had Justice Green not passed away, I would have lost Friedrichs five to four. So don't, so don't start with this. It's not wasn't about you, Ron. That was clearly I'm trying here. All right. Um, but uh, bear with me. All right. um, it's in my DNA. What can I tell you? Uh, there, a divided court ruled that the Illinois' extraction of agency fees from non-consenting public sector employees uh, violated the First Amendment, and in the process overruled uh, Abood versus Detroit Board of Education. In her dissent, as you know, Justice Elena Kagan argued that the majority had weaponized, in her words, the First Amendment in a way that unleashes judges now and in the future to intervene in economic and regulatory policy. Um, what is your sense of that? Has the First Amendment become weaponized, as she says? So I think it's, um, as you can tell, I tend to give long answers. So I'm going to give a long answer to this, too. I think it's yes, but it's more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about the, this court in the First Amendment, people say, oh, well, this is the most First Amendment-friendly court in the country's history, and that's true, I think. Um, and then some people offer the explanation for it. Well, that's because the court's pro-business, and this is just a way of being pro-business. I don't think that's a, a, a full, complete, accurate explanation of it, because there are a lot of cases that where the court vindicates First Amendment interests, Snyder against Phelps, you know, the, the Westboro Baptist protest, Stevens, the Crush film, you know, you name it, uh, where it, it wasn't about that at all, and the court was still vindicating the First Amendment interests. Um, and so, and some people say, well, it's, you know, the new, and a variant to that, well, it's the new Lochner. Again, I don't think that explanation accounts for cases like uh, the ones I described, or Paul's case, uh, Brown. Um, so there's more going on. Um, and, and I think probably what's going on is that, you know, you can love the First Amendment for lots of different reasons. You can think that we ought to protect speech because of its uh, importance to the democratic process. You can think we ought to protect it for libertarian reasons around your autonomy as a person to say what you want to say or your autonomy as a person to make your own mind up about the information you receive. You can, you can uh, think we should protect speech because of the value of check government. You can think about it as because of the, the contribution of truth. So you can have lots of different motivations that can get you to the same bottom line conclusion in a lot of cases. So I think that's that some explanation like that probably explains why you've got the, uh, the, the, uh, the court being as friendly to the First Amendment as it's been, as supportive of the First Amendment. But what's interesting to me, and just kind of start to answer your question a little more directly, is to see the cases in which the, the court, which the First Amendment claim wins by lopsided majorities versus the kinds of cases where the First Amendment claim wins by five to four majorities. And the claims that win by lopsided majorities, and sometimes where the votes are scrambled along non-ideological lines, like Brown was another case like that. Who argued that? Yeah, no, I said, I'm pointing at the guy oh, who argued I, I, it. I already gave him credit for it. I already gave him credit for it. Um, and so, uh, you know, in, it's the, in the cases where there's a lopsided win, usually it's a speech interest on one side and an interest, a government interest in morality or order on the other side. When the cases are 5-4, they're almost invariably, and Janus is in this category, cases where there's a speech interest on one side and there's a government regulatory interest being asserted to try to uh, promote equality uh, or, 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 or deal with the effects of systematic inequality. And, and, I, so I, and I think, you know, you put... So I think you put, the, uh, you put cases like McCutcheon, Citizens United, um, and, and Janus is a good example of that, I think, um, where you know there was a systematic campaign undertaken to get a boot overruled, um, and uh, there was a case called Knox uh, where the you know first the sledgehammer was swung once and put some cracks in it. Then there was Harris against Quinn, another case that Paul and I did. You know, sledgehammer was swung again. Some more knocks were put in it, and then you know Friedrichs was a case where I think probably. No, you didn't lose that been, one. Uh, yeah, but you, everybody knew where it was going. Uh, uh, where I, I, you know, as I said, I think probably it would have been a five-four loss, and then you had Janus. And I think the problem with that is that um, there are a couple of problems with it, to my mind at least. Um, 
One is that, you know, you had <coughs> this point which uh, none other than Justice Scalia had made in the earlier years of this Abu doctrine. This is the doctrine that said, just so everybody knows what we're talking about here, that the um, that Abood was a case that said that unions, public sector unions representing employees who don't join the union can constitutionally charge a fee to those employees to cover the cost of collective bargaining, et cetera, uh, around their conditions of employment, but can't charge them a, f a broader fee to, to subsidize the union's political activities. It's kind of a compromise decision the court reached in the 70s. Uh, and the you know that decision had held up fine and been applied for decades. And Justice Scalia had explained that well, the reason you need a rule like that is because of the problem of free riding. That the public public employees know that the union will have have an obligation to and will negotiate on their behalf, whether they pay this fee or not. It's only human nature. Lots of people aren't going to pay the fee. And this is this kind of statute's a corrective of that. Uh, and so. You know, and that was an understanding that, to me, it seems A, completely right, B, makes a lot of sense, C, had, you know, worked, there were issues about policing the boundary of what's political and what's supporting your, uh, your collective bargaining activities, but, you know, in the main, something that made a good deal of sense. And then, in general, of course, you know, as, as those of you here know, because you're, you're, you're focused on the First Amendment, public employees like, have no First Amendment rights at all. <laughs> They get, you know, aside from a few whistleblower cases, they, in cases like Garcetti and, uh, and Bureau of, uh, of Borough of Durier and others, they routinely had any First Amendment claims subject to very, very lenient scrutiny uh, on the theory that the government has to have a lot of latitude to manage its workforce. And so when you put those two things together and uh, and then you, and despite the force to me of those two arguments, you end up with a 5-4 decision of the court holding that it violates the First Amendment to impose these fair share fees, I can understand why Justice Kagan reacted the way she did in her dissent, because it does feel, to me at least, like it was an agenda-driven well, decision. Well, on that note, let me ask you, she was also critical of the court's departures from stare decisis. Um, what is your view of, of that doctrine as applied by the Roberts Court? Ha, so um, I've thought about this a lot, too. Um, and I guess my view of it is that um, the, you know, I think statistically people, I've not gone back and tried to figure this out myself, but statistically people say the Roberts Court actually doesn't overrule precedent at a rate significantly different than prior courts. It seems to do so in particularly important salient cases, however. Um, and, 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 so I guess, to my mind, the, uh, the notion of stare decisis hasn't been very much of a constraint uh, on the Roberts Court. I, you know, for example, in, in arguing McCutcheon, I, I, you know, I thought it would be a, a, a waste of time to make any kind of a real stare decisis argument there, um, and that the the criteria that the court applies for overruling are malleable enough um, that the most I think one can do as an advocate now in front of this court trying to preserve an existing precedent is to use stare decisis kind of as a shaming device, <laughs> you know, that you, you know, especially given that in all of the confirmation hearings, as we saw just last week, they all go in and say, well, it's a settled, settled law. It's a precedent of the court. You have to take that very seriously. Here are the criteria you apply. You have to apply them very seriously with great respect for the settled law. Did I say it was settled law? You know? um, and uh, so you know, one thing I think an advocate can do is you start decisive to kind of say, hey, remember you said all those. It's a way of saying, remember, you said all those things. But I don't think in practice it operates as very much of a constraining force <coughs> at all. Uh, I want to ask you about a case you won. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, or repel the yeah. uh, gay marriage um, precedent. Um, as we, uh, as the years go on, um, how do you think that precedent will fare uh, when confronted by claims of religious conscience? Not uh, that it'll be overruled, but yeah. do you think that there, we're likely to see 
claims of re a religious conscience chipping away at that precedent. What's your sense of that? Yes, definitely. I mean, it almost happened, although it was cast in speech and not religious conscience terms, it really was a the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, of course, it really was a religious conscience case when you get right down to it. There are going to be claims like that. The court, uh, there's, uh, I think if, just, if Judge Kavanaugh becomes Justice Kavanaugh, I think there's going to be a pretty solid five justice majority that thinks those claims of religious conscience uh, deserve great solicitude. Um, and I found, you know, now my, my, my sort of sense of that is shaped a lot by having done uh, the Hobby Lobby case and the Zubik case, which were about the contraceptive mandate under the Affordable Care Act. And, you know, Hobby Lobby was a hard case for the government, I think. To my mind, Zubik should not have been such a hard case for the government. And, you know, it ended up being kind of a mushy decision after Justice Scalia passed away. But I think that would have been another one where we would have lost by four had uh, Justice Scalia not passed away. And that, you know, the, the, the notion that checking a box saying you oppose uh, contraception, which would trigger the government independently providing contraception to the employees of the company, you know, boy, that, I'm not saying it was an insincere, I'm sure it was a sincerely held belief, but boy, in terms of the, the efforts of the government to actually accommodate religious practice in a minimally intrusive way. You can't really do much better than that. Um, and that the five justices seemed, at least based on the oral argument, seemed to me to be disposed to find that the claim of religious conscience should prevail over the rights of the employees, third parties to this whole thing, even in a situation like that, uh, suggests the strength to the conservative justices of these claims of religious conscience. And so I would be very surprised if those kinds of claims didn't prevail in numerous circumstances. Um, Last March, you argued a case with Paul Clement on the yep. other side, yep. uh, Archdiocese of Washington versus Washington uh, Metropolitan Area tran uh, Transit. Uh, you argued that before the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Uh, I gather that Judge Brett, then Judge Brett, well, Judge yeah. still, Judge Brett uh, Kavanaugh was on the case for oral arguments, uh, but did not sit on the judgment uh, pass it, of that case. Uh, can you say a few words about that case? And did he participate in uh, oral arguments? And, uh, yes, he did. Um, and it was a, just tell people yeah, about a really case? interesting case. I represented Wamada, Wamada, you know, the Transit Authority, uh, against the Archdiocese. The Archdiocese had wanted to run during the Advent season a very benign ad, uh, which I'm sure many of you have uh, seen, <coughs> that uh, the Catholic Church runs during the holiday season often around the country. It's, uh, it's a, it says, find the perfect gift, and it's a, an illustration of the three wise men and the star. Um, WMATA had a, has, uh, a, a, and put in place a couple of years ago, a policy that said, among other things, that it would not run ads that either promoted or opposed religion. Um, and the reason for that was principally because uh, over the years, WMATA had run under a prior policy that said we'll basically have an open public forum and run anything, um, uh, had run ads that were critical of various religious faiths, <coughs> critical of the Catholic bishops, critical of other faiths, and then uh, more, more recent years, uh, critical of Islam. Uh, and the the bus company thought this was causing a lot of headaches that it uh, uh, thought was uh, detrimental to its ability to run the bus system. And so it adopted a policy that was broader then, but it included this uh, exclusion. So the Catholic Church sued under the First Amendment, claiming that this was viewpoint discrimination against, in a public forum against religious speech. And I defended the, um, I defended WMATA. And uh, if you want to get a sense of where uh, Judge Kavanaugh and, and uh, presumably soon to be Justice Kavanaugh is on issues of uh, religious freedom, find the link to that oral argument. Um, it went on for about 40, I was at the podium for 42 minutes. 40 of those 42 minutes I was being questioned by Judge Kavanaugh. And the intensity of the questioning just kept going up and up 
Ben up, Ben up. Uh, he has very, very, very strong views in that case. And uh, I, I think if you listen to it, you'll agree with me, there's no doubt how he would have voted had he voted, but he, he didn't vote, but he did participate in the argument. Um, and, you know, basically that, that it was clear to him from his, clear to me from his questioning that he viewed this as, he viewed the policy and its application of this as an act of hostility to the Catholic Church. Um, and was utterly unpersuaded by the argument that I was trying to make, which was, no, no, you know, if the, if the bus company runs your ad, then it has to run the ad criticizing the bishops, and it has to run the ad with the cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad, and it has to run all these ads. And it's just, you know, they have to be viewpoint neutral. In order to be viewpoint neutral, you can't, you have to, uh, you have to uh, exclude the pro-religious ads as well as the anti-religious ads. But that had absolutely no traction with him at all, um, and so I, I, I this is you know I don't want to presume too much. I guess maybe he would have voted differently than his uh, questions and arguments suggested, but I don't think so. I don't think so. So uh, just before we turn it over to audience, I'm going to ask two questions, and we call these lightning round, okay. as, as they say. So uh, uh, first of all. Um, at an Oxford Union event, uh, you took issue with the life tenure for Supreme Court justices. Uh, tell us, uh, I'll elaborate on that. I think an 18-year term would be a good thing um, for a lot of reasons. One, uh, it would ratchet down the intensity of confirmation battles, uh, which I think would be a healthy thing for all of us. Um, and uh, two, I think it, it, you know, there is a... I think, and I, and I think we may see this in this country um, uh, in coming decades, that justices there for a very, very long time can find themselves quite a bit out of step with where society is. Um, that's not always a problem, but it can be a problem, and it can be a problem, I think, if a majority of the court is significantly out of step, and that given now, you know, when Justice Powell was put on the court, he was what, Paul, 65, right? 60, 60. Yeah, mid-60s. Like, no one in a million years would do that now. You know, neither party would do it, you know? If they could find somebody 29 to put up there and get away with it, they would do it, you know? And so... Um, the day, and, they being and Democrats and Republicans. Both sides, yeah. sure, yeah. Both sides, because, the, you know, the whole game is how, you know, how many decades can we control this seat? And so you find the youngest person you can plausibly get through. and um, And... And, and so I just feel like, you know, uh, you know one of the things that's tied to a broader concern, which I think I talked about there, too, which is, you know, the, one of the things that really happened to me in the job was, I know this is lightning round, so I, I'm, I'm not really following that. but lightning. So, all right. Um, was that I came to appreciate justices like Justice O'Connor and Justice Powell more in the job um, because, yeah, they wrote opinions that law professors like you like to you know pick apart because they're not intellectually all that coherent and they you know they're compromises and all these ways. But they both had an understanding, and you could see it. I think in the affirmative action context with Justice Powell in Bakke and with Justice O'Connor in uh, in uh, the University of Michigan case that in cases like that, you know, it's a really difficult thing for society if one side or the other walks away 100% the winner. Because, you know, in an affirmative action case, if the white students challenging the policies walk away 100% the winner, the black students are essentially being told that this lived experience of yours of being, um, you know, of, of coming from a group that has been subjected to this kind of discrimination for all these years is not something the law is going to recognize. But if the black students go away 100% the winner, then these white students are saying, look, yes, there was a history of discrimination, but you know, you're pinning it all on me. Walk away 100% the loser. And so both Justice Powell and Bakke and then Justice O'Connor in the Michigan case found a way to, that each side could walk away partially a winner. And you, you can't really do it in an intellectually satisfying opinion. I get that, and that's important. I don't mean to denigrate it too much. But, 
But there was a real value to that, I thought. And so, to my mind, this 18-year term thing is connected up to that in that if we could maybe make this process a little less intensely ideological, um, we wouldn't have as much division in the court, we wouldn't have as much division in society as a result. Um, people might, we might end up with the kinds of people who would look more for common ground uh, rather than 100% victory. So. so my last question, um, is this, uh, what is your sense of the latitude a Kavanaugh-constituted Supreme Court might permit when it comes to presidential power? Uh, I think that the answer is a, a lot, although I, I think it's a mistake to assume that the Chief Justice is in the same place um, as Justice Kavanaugh, as Judge Kavanaugh, seems to be based on his prior writings. Do you mean that in presidential power or across the board? Presidential, I, I mean, I, 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 you know, some place, some things they'll be in the same place, some things they won't across the board. In presidential power, I think um, it would, for example, surprise me a great deal if a case ever got to the Supreme Court in which the question was whether a subpoena could be enforced against the president. In other words, if, if the United States versus Nixon round two came to the court, it would surprise me a great deal if the Chief Justice would vote that the subpoena couldn't be enforced. I don't know what a Justice Kavanaugh would do, but it would surprise me a great deal if the Chief Justice would do that. And the Chief Justice voted against presidential authority repeatedly when I was SG. <laughs> now, maybe that was just for ideological reasons, but but I don't I don't think so. You know, Zivotofsky, the the Jerusalem passport statute case, uh, Justice Kennedy was the deciding vote there. The Chief was in dissent. Um, you know, I can rattle off some other cases too. So, so I, I don't think it will necessarily, I, I think it'll mean that the chief will have a lot to say about those issues, more than he had in the court with Justice Kennedy on it. Um, but I don't think that Justice Kavanaugh's arrival there will mean necessarily that presidential power is always going to prevail. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Lee Levine as we uh, turn to folks uh, for uh, Questions from uh, here in D.C. or are our guests in uh, in New York? And first of all, thank you very much. We appreciate that. And now fun. comes uh, round two. Okay. okay. So for folks in D.C. who would like to ask questions or make comments, there are these little devices all around the table. Um, and you need to take one and press it to talk so that you can be heard in New York and, more importantly, recorded for posterity. Um, so... I'm going to start, I'm going to ask a question, and then we'll throw it open to folks here and in New York. Um, so this is a question that I asked to all of our distinguished guests who have um, uh, appeared before the Supreme Court with some frequency. Um, one area that the court has not delved into in, I think it's now 17 years, going on 18, are any case, any First Amendment cases involving uh, what used to be referred to as the press. Yeah. Um, and so my question is, um, do you think that that is going to change anytime soon? And if so, and assuming Justice Kavanaugh becomes Justice Kavanaugh, um, how are we likely to fare? Uh, you know, so a, a, a case may force itself onto their docket, um, but I don't sense any appetite on the part of the court to do that, to delve into the question of what freedom of the press means is distinct from freedom of speech. I think that partly that may be because it, with each passing year, it becomes a harder question because you have to sort of, in, in light of all of the changes in um, the uh, ecosystem of expression that have occurred as a result of technology, what, who's the press? Um, a blogger is the press, or is it, you know, who's the press? You know, you're going to have a lot of hard questions about that, and I think the court's going to feel like it doesn't have the first idea what the answer to those questions will be. I also would, and again, this is just a gut instinct. I don't know if this is rightly or not, but my sense is that I don't feel like there are five votes up there for the proposition that um, reporters should uh, get special solicitude when they get uh, subpoenaed. 
uh, for information in a criminal case. And, you know, may, maybe in an extreme case, you might be able to do it, but it just doesn't. doesn't it's not the kind of court they are. You know, there are, it's a very what, what I think is the sentiment that's driving the majority of the court in free speech cases. I think is a very libertarian focused set of ideas. And I just don't think they map very well over to press freedom because press freedom is all about the functional role that the press plays in ensuring government accountability, checking government abuses, making sure the electorate is fully informed, you know, those sets of concerns. Um, I think they motivate some of the justices, but I don't think that's the essence of where they're coming from on free speech. And so I, I wouldn't, be wouldn't be optimistic that they would embra embrace a more robust concept of freedom of the press. And so I think if you put those two things together, that the question of who the press is and you know, all the definitional problems that would arise if they really start taking the idea of freedom of the press seriously as a separate a font of constitutional law with or I'm just you know again instinctually think they're going to be their predilections I would not be an optimist about it. Uh, questions comments anybody in DC yeah I have a question first of all thank you for your remarks been very interesting um, what do you think of the idea or do you think it would ever happen if or when the Democrats take control of entire Congress and the White House, packing the court to dilute the conservative uh, I a think majority. This is going to be a big problem. I think we're going to face it. If, you know, if, I don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows what's going to happen. You know, assuming we have an election in 2020, that, you know, <laughs> that, that, that we'll have an election, you know, if, if we have an election and the, Democrats, the, and the Democrats win the, the Senate and the House and the presidency, um, there's going to be enormous pressure to add two seats to the Supreme Court. Enormous pressure. It's going, that, that is going to become a very salient political issue. For my own sake, I think it would, my own, my own sense of it is that if a law like that were enacted, even though it has happened in our yeah. history in the 19th century, in fact, repeatedly, that yeah. the size of the court was, was uh, changed, basically to change the outcomes, um, that it would shred what little is left of the public's confidence that the court is not a political institution and that that would really be a bad thing for the long-term health of the country. That having been said, I think the argument in favor of doing it, which I hope my prior comment makes clear I don't agree with, but I think the argument in favor of doing it has a great deal of force because the, you know, after what happened to Merrick Garland, the argument is the only way to rectify the long-term consequences of that historic injustice, departure from our norms, is to change the composition of the court and add two more people. Because otherwise, American history is going to be very different than it should have been had people respected the, the norms that should guide this process. That's, you know, to me, that argument has a great deal of force to it. Um, and so I, I think this is going to be a really rocky uh, historical moment for the country and for the court. Now, you know, a lot would have to happen for all of that to materialize, but it could. It could. So you're saying you would, you would be against, you personally would be against yes. it? Because yeah. Yes. Because I think for the long term, that's it for the court, basically. I think that's it. You know, then... It, it, now, you know, a lot of that, I would say, you know, my sense of things, a lot of Democrats, a lot of progressives are there. And they're there, it's not just because of Merrick Garland, it's because of Bush against Gore. And, uh, which, you know, of course, it's a remarkable thing. I'm, you know, obviously just spewing here a little bit. But, you know, look, we hear all about, the, you know, you have to constrain yourself when you interpret the Constitution. And the way you interpret the Constitution, particularly the Equal Protection Clauses, the original public meaning informed by precedent. You know, well, except when everything's really at stake, then you don't do that. Then you do whatever the heck you want. And so I think, you know, that, I think progressives, you know, absorb that blow and for, and I think manage to overcome the sense of cynicism that that decision uh, engendered. And then the 
progressives' willingness to have faith in the court was gradually kind of pulled itself back together over time. But the, the Garland situation, and then, you know, combined, it's not just that, of course, it's the fact that only two Court of Appeals judges in the last two years of the Obama administration were confirmed. Uh, the reason all these Court of Appeals judges are being confirmed now is because these seats were held open instead of people being confirmed. Uh, you know, there's a lot of progressive people who think this is all just a sham. It's this is not, there's not there's no independent integrity to the judicial process. It's all just it's all just politics. It's all just manipulated. And so, why shouldn't I support an expansion of the court? I, I think that's just you know, a lot of people are going to think that way. I don't, but but as you can tell from what I'm saying, ah, you know, it's got force to it. Okay. Lee, we couldn't hear that question here in uh, New York. Do you have the, the thing in green? I'm trying to push the button. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I won't repeat it all. I'm just saying if Justice, Chief Justice Roberts is the swing vote, I think he'll be very sensitive to the concerns you just articulated as evidenced by his Obamacare vote. Maybe I'm wrong, but I have a feeling that's the case. And I wouldn't be so sure if you can't pull Brett Kavanaugh along with him from time to time on that kind of an argument. But I, I, have, I have a question about this whole issue of the conservative liberal dynamic. You mentioned uh, conscience claims and how this court is going to be receptive to those claims. But of course, it was Justice Scalia who kind of neutered the free exercise clause and kind of eliminated conscience claims as a constitutional matter. So my question to you is, do you see any possibility that the conservatives on the court will rethink Smith, which at the time it was decided was regarded as an abomination by liberals? I know. I know. So I guess I'm wondering what your thought about that is. Yeah. I wrestled with this exact question a lot when I was trying to figure out the best way to argue Hobby Lobby and Zubik, the two you know, contraceptive coverage cases. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I was an, as a, you're an advocate, you're, your head's in a place that the advocate's head is in. And so um, I became completely convinced in preparing for argument in Hobby Lobby and then working on the Zubik case that Justice Scalia had it totally right in Smith, totally right, that you you just the law has to apply equally to everyone and you can't have a conscience opt out to generally applicable laws because if you do then every person is a law to him or herself and that society can't operate that way but it especially can't operate that way if your opting out inflicts a harm on a third party or denies something that a third party has an entitlement to under law so that's how I decided to start my oral argument. I, uh, in Hobby Lobby, I started with a quote from Justice Jackson to this effect from an old case. Um, and I made the point, I made the quote. Um, the Chief Justice interrupted me, as he sometimes did in my opening statements, and said, oh, we're past that. <laughs> and so, um, so, I, so that's a very long way of saying, yeah, I think that um, there's great deal of skepticism among conservative justices that um, that Smith was correct, is correct, um, and that the dynamic is just different now. In that, in in the 80s and 70s and 80s, when these cases came to the court, they tended to be Native American religious practices or other kinds of uh, practices. I don't mean to disparage them, but you might you would think of as fringe kinds of religious practices seeking exemptions from generally applicable laws, often drug laws. Now they're very different. Now it's, um, it's mainstream religions whose adherents feel like the tide of society is moving uh, away from them in a way that threatens what they really believe in. And those kinds of claims just have a different sort of resonance. And so I think probably it wouldn't surprise me at all if Smith got rethought. And I and I don't know what you know. Maybe liberals will agree with that, but but I don't. But I don't think so. I don't think so. A uh, question about uh, campaign finance cases: the argument that overturns or uh, limits uh, campaign finance law 
is corruption. That, that, and yet the court tends and does define corruption as quid pro quo corruption. Historically, if you go back to the founders, corruption was not included quid pro quo, but it was a very small part of it. It was really undue influence. And I was wondering how we got to the point where corruption, which would uh, uh, attempt to deal with it, that would justify broad campaign financing laws, has been narrowed to quid pro quo corruption. Yeah. So, um, another not short answer. <laughs> Sorry, but so in preparing for McCutcheon, um, I got a call from. Um, a friend uh, who I'd worked with in the government and was then back at Harvard, Dan Meltzer, who's now sadly passed away, saying, you know, Larry Lessig, who's at Harvard, has got a lot of thoughts about that. He'd like to come see you. Um, and so I said, okay, sure. And, he, and Larry Lessig came and saw me. And he made a pitch kind of along the lines that you, that you just described, David. And he said, you know, if you go back to the historical evidence, you'll see the framers had a much different sense of uh, corruption and that... Uh, we really ought to ditch the kinds of arguments that we were making uh, in support of a law on McCutcheon and, and uh, make that kind of an originalist argument instead. So I asked him to send me a bunch of stuff. So he sent me a bunch of stuff. And then I gave it to my team of genius lawyers in the SG's office and asked them to look at it. And I looked at it. And I thought about this a lot. And I thought that this was never going to work as an advocacy strategy. That it's undeniably true that the framers' concern about corruption of the of, of individual political actors went far beyond the notion of quid pro quo corruption. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, but what the historical record didn't show to me, at least, um, based on the, just this one, you know, one look at it back then, which was a few years ago now. What it showed to me was that that was the meaning of corruption, not that that was the meaning of the, of the First Amendment. And that, the, that, that, yes, there was a broad concern about corruption, but did that mean that the framers thought that the government ought to have great latitude to regulate expression in order to deal with that problem of corruption? And on that, I thought... Again, just my own judgment. But on that, I thought there was a real paucity of historical evidence. And that you know, one of the key things that the uh, proponents of that point of view focused on was the idea that in defending the House of Representatives in the Federalist Papers and in, in, in other uh, speeches and writings, some of the framers said, well, look, the whole point of the House of Representatives is supposed to be especially responsive to the people, meaning the whole people, not some subset of the people who could corrupt it through uh, giving it money. And I, you know, I'm sure that's true. But I thought, if I stand up there at the podium and say that, I'm going to get killed. No, there's not a single conservative justice going to think for a minute that that was a, a sufficient reason to read the First Amendment to uh, allow the government to regulate in this way. And that um, and so, you know, one of the things with SG, I was practical, you know, I tried to say, I, I, I was not trying to fit the, our kinds of arguments that I was making into some kind of ideological agenda, my own or the government's or anybody else's. I was trying to be a lawyer and win cases. And I just thought that there wasn't a chance, you know, I needed to move a conservative vote over to, to uphold that statute. And I thought there wasn't a chance because they weren't going to think of this as an originalist argument because it wasn't about the original public meaning of the First Amendment. It was about the original meaning of something else, which is what do the framers think about corruption? And so I, well, I think that, you know, there is historical evidence there. I think what I think that gets to is this misguided idea that, that the only compelling interest is a, an interest in avoiding quid pro quo corruption. But I didn't think that was going to translate. And part of the reason was, you know, there are, as with so many, uh, so many of these sort of questions about what the original public meaning is, you can find a Madison quote going one way, you can find a Madison quote going the other way. 
And Justice Scalia found a mass in quote going one, in the other way, you know, and it's in one of his opinions. And so I just thought, I'm not going to get a fifth vote. And it's, nobody's going to think I'm really making an originalist argument that's going to get me a, a fifth vote. So I just didn't do it. I just didn't do it. No. Uh, let's go to New York. Any questions or comments from New York? Hi, I, I have a question. It's Matt Schaefer. Um, we spoke briefly about Justice Brennan earlier, and obviously. <laughs> We've been talking a lot about federal courts, but assuming um, the Kavanaugh gets confirmed and that creates a solid five justice conservative block, Justice Brennan in you know, the late 1970s said, well, maybe there's something to be done with activist Supreme Courts in at the state level. And I was just wondering what you thought, the, thought about a, a strategy that engages Supreme Courts at the state level on civil liberties issues, um, you know, more than the last few years. Yeah, so Justice Brennan was so savvy, I suspect he didn't describe it as activism at the state <laughs> court level. But, um, but, you know, there's signs of that already now, the, the ruling of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court on the redistricting um, is a, a really good example of the ways in which state courts can invoke state law principles to achieve results that you wouldn't have any optimism about achieving in the federal courts. Um, and then I, you know, one thing that's happening, California is a good example of it, um, and, but I'm, I'm sure it's happening elsewhere too. I'm, I'm unfortunately not as up to speed on it as I should be, but you know, uh, Governor Brown in California took very seriously the idea of trying to ensure that the California Supreme Court was an intellectual powerhouse um, and that uh, and, and uh, would reflect a different set of uh, views about the law and uh, approaches to the law than the, than the predominance of the federal bench did. And so, you know, there I, I think you know, taking arguments to the California Supreme Court, for example, um, uh, would be, uh, you know, uh, uh, under state law, would be quite a good idea, and I'm sure there are other states where that's true too. So, uh, so as in many things, I think Justice Brennan was wise about that too. Anybody else in New York, Floyd? Uh, yeah. So we have this great First Amendment court, and uh, I agree with you about its general uh, powerful adherence to First Amendment norms. How, how do you think this court would deal with, because they haven't had many cases in this area, uh, some of the old conflicts which have not been before them, the First Amendment vis-a-vis -vis national security, for example. Um, uh, who would win the Pentagon Papers case today? So, uh, you know, that's a great question. You know, Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project is probably not a good sign. Um, but having said that, I think um, that, you know, that, you know and, and I don't mean to say anything disparaging about the litigants in that case or the issue at stake in that case, but I don't think the stakes were really high enough in that case to test the proposition, um, whereas in the Pentagon Papers, the stakes would be high enough. And I think if the court were in the next Pentagon Papers case to reject the First Amendment claim, um, it would, uh, I, I just think that it, that would tend to reinforce the criticism from the left uh, that the, that this, the, that the justice, the conservative justices have just weaponized the First Amendment to advance uh, the interests of the economic elites. Um, and I think going to the point Kevin made a little while ago that the, you know, the Chief Justice would be I think pretty sensitive uh, to that. Um, that said, I don't think it would be unanimous. Um, I don't think the Pentagon Papers case would be unanimous now. Um, no, I know it wasn't then, but I don't think it would be unanimous now. I, I think, and I don't, and I, and I don't know what a Justice Kavanaugh would do, but I would be nervous about it. You know, he, the combination of him serving in the White House in the immediate years after. 9-11 uh, and being, you know, whatever he's saying in his confirmation hearings, you know, quite clearly played some role in the administration's shaping of its aggressive policies uh, in the wake of 9-11. Uh, 
uh, and then defending them in court on very aggressive uh, Article II grounds. Um, and then his track record on the D.C. Circuit would lead me to think that in most cases he's going to be very highly deferential to claims of national security. So, so I don't know. So, but, but I still think that I still think you'd win the Pentagon Papers case this time too. Anybody else in D.C.? I uh, agreed with your point about the court not having much of an appetite uh, to take on press cases, and they haven't in some time. And yet, for new media, for the Internet, uh, beginning 21 years ago with Reno versus ACLU, up until two terms ago in Packingham versus North Carolina, the court has reaffirmed strong protections for new media that empower individuals. Um, at the same time, it's happening at a time in our political dialogue where social media are increasingly being questioned and being argued is that they're tools to undermine democracy. Where do you see that going, where you have a court that is very strongly affirming First Amendment principles for media like that, and at the same time, a lot of uh, political argument about the responsibility of social media companies and all So, you know, and I said at the outset, I thought you could sort of roughly at least sort the Supreme Court's First Amendment cases into two buckets, one bucket being the you know, free speech versus order and morality kinds of cases where they tend to be super majorities and there's not clear ideological divisions, and free speech versus government efforts to address inequality or its effects of being 5-4 splits. You know, I, it does seem to me there's going to there is some prospect that there's going to be legislation at some point that tries to regulate social media either to deal with the kinds of problems you just identified or to deal with or or or, or based on the notion that um, these entities have accumulated too much economic power and they need to be regulated in the public interest in the way that the oil companies and the railroads were, et cetera, um, and in those kinds of cases. I would bet that they'll be 5-4 to strike those laws down because I think they're in that more or less in that second bucket and I think you'll have five you'll have a majority of the justices saying no 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 this this is not this goes against the our libertarian understanding of what the first amendment should be uh, should do and they'll strike you know obviously depend on the particular circumstances but if I had to bet you know in gross that's what I would bet Anyone else in New York? Justice Brennan, through most of his time on the court, or maybe all of his time on the court, seemed to take the view that the more speech, the better. Um, speech can't do so much harm that we can't deal with it by not having more speech. Uh, following up a little bit on Bob's question, do you think he would have had the same attitude about the proliferation of social media, the rapid spread of information in ways that newspapers and maybe even conventional broadcast didn't have that same kind of effect, or would his view have changed? It's so hard, you know, that's like asking, that, you know, that, that's the same kind of question as saying, you know, what would the framers think about what's going on? That, it's not quite as far back, but it's like, you know, he couldn't have imagined this world we live in now. Um, so I don't know for sure. But, you know, the Times, uh, I mean, it was a good example. One, my term, one of the cases that was up there was the question of, uh, you know, putting a uh, crash up in a public park. And... That was, for my term at least, by far the hardest case for Justice Brennan to decide because it pitted two things he believed in against each other. Um, it pitted uh, his belief in the freedom of speech against his concerns about government establishing religion. And he didn't know what to do. It just fried his circuits. And so I, I suspect that the, the kind of question you're posing would be in the sort of it would fry his circuits category. So I just don't know what he would do because it would... Because you're right, you know, he certainly had the view you described. Of course, he would know better than anybody, but he did. Um, and and yet, I would 
be surprised if you weren't troubled by uh, the, 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 some of the consequences that we're seeing now. Uh, I may be wrong on this, but let me try it out anyway. It seems to me that most of the people, plaintiffs, asserting free, First Amendment free speech rights these days are conservatives. And it, so that might reflect the tendency of the court to support them. Is that the right? Does that make some sense? So I've thought about that some, that... You know, one way, I, I don't actually think I agree with this, but one way of thinking about cases like Snyder and, and Stevens, you know, like why are these people, um, why are these people protecting crush videos? And why are they protecting these crazy Westboro Baptist people uh, who are disrupting the funeral of a soldier killed in battle? One way of thinking about that is because they have, they see the principal threat to speech being uh, the, the imposition of political correctness, you know, on campuses and in uh, municipal governments and state governments controlled by progressives, and uh, and in order to have a robust enough doctrine that it can be invoked to limit the ability of public authorities in those circumstances to suppress speech inappropriately, in their view, they need to uh, rule the way they do. You know, it's possible. I guess it's possible. But I don't, I, I, you know, I think it's deeper than that. I just think, I think their concern about political correctness flows from their libertarianism, but I just think that they have a very, it, it, they think about these cases in libertarian terms. It just, it's just, it's not about making the democratic process work better. It's not about checking the abuses of government power. It's about, you know, individuals get to say what they want and think what they want and Government shouldn't be policing that, you know, either from uh, from the perspective of limiting what you want to what you want to be able to say, or getting in between you and the information as you receive it. I think that's where they're coming from, I, and I just think it's genuinely where they're coming from. I, I, so I don't think these decisions are instrumental. I think it's where they're coming from. So. So I do a lot of work on uh, college campuses in connection with free speech. And um, one thing that's notable to me, and I think it's accelerated in recent years, is the sort of increasing sentiment, uh, particularly on the left, uh, of the need to suppress hate speech, offensive speech. Uh, and it's cast in terms of, you know, harm and, um, you know, making people unsafe and the need for safe spaces and things like that. Uh, do you see that as, as more of a, a sort of a fringe a view on the left, or do you see that view getting real purchase in the sort of legal elite on the left, um, in, in the judiciary that exists now, and in a scenario like you envision where maybe the left gets control of the court in the future? Do you think that is a serious view moving into the left uh, wing mainstream, or do you see that as remaining yeah. on the fringes? So it's interesting. Um, this is one of the great divisions I have with my 27 year old daughter. Because um, I, I look at what's going on with these you know, a lot of these settings in college campuses, and I'm going, well, this is crazy. Um, but she, it makes my 27-year-old daughter furious. Um, and so I, I guess I think it's, I don't think it's fringe in the sense that, you know, I, I think a lot of people my daughter's age who are progressives think this way. Um, and so, you know, maybe if they're dominating the Supreme Court 30 years from now <laughs> and they still think the same way, then it might be an issue. But I think were you know were questions like that to come before this court, I don't know. I think they would be seven to eight to one decisions upholding the right to free speech. Um, I, I don't think I, I you know, and I think that would be true if Merrick Garland were up there. I just I just don't think I, I don't think Justice Kagan or Justice Ginsburg um, or even Justice Breyer, and I, I don't even know about Justice Sotomayor. You know, Breyer maybe depend on some circumstances. He's got a much more uh, complicated view about the First Amendment than somebody else. <laughs> but, I, but even so, I'd be, I'd, I'd, be I'd be surprised. I would just be surprised if they found that. Um, forgive the the administrative law nerds among us, but what do you see in terms of the future of the Chevron doctrine? Ha. <laughs> so. Um, <coughs> You know, when I, I argued several administrative law cases, and it was one of the ones I argued was in, in um, my last term, it's an energy regulation case, 
where it would have been really easy to rule in my favor under Chevron. Um, and I ended up winning the case. Justice Kagan wrote the opinion, and the word Chevron is not in the opinion. And to me, that was like a huge signal that if she put Chevron in the opinion, that she had the votes of Justice Kennedy and the Chief Justice in that case, and that I, I just was a huge signal to me that if the word Chevron was in that opinion, she wouldn't have had their votes. Um, and so I think that there's a pretty strong predisposition that the basic premise of Chevron is wrong. You know, Gorsuch, uh, Justice Gorsuch said what he said in the uh, Gutierrez case and his concurrence in the Tenth Circuit. And then there was this case, this term, this patent case, where one of the arguments made, it was challenged to some uh, PTO regulation. And one of the arguments made was that you shouldn't defer to the PTO regulation because you should overrule Chevron and be done with this. And although I wasn't there, it was reported to me by several people who were there, Justice Gorsuch announced the opinion for the court and he said, well, they, you know, the petitioners made an argument that we should uh, invalidate the, this uh, rule because uh, you sh Chevron <coughs> should be overruled. And then he said, but Chevron remains good law for now. <laughs> There's a pause about that long. And so, um, you know, you put all that together. Now, there, there are, but there are two alternative theories to that. One is, yeah, they don't need to overrule Chevron. They'll just do you know, one illuminating. If you read, um, Judge Kavanaugh wrote a book review. It was published in the Harvard Law Review, uh, reviewing Judge Katzman's book about statutory interpretation. And in that, he's got this, you know, his view is, you know, really the judge's job is to figure out the best interpretation of the statute, and that's true even if the statute's ambiguous. So one thing they may do is just say, well, you know, Chevron exists for that rare category of cases where you can really be confident that the uh, that the Congress has delegated a policy call to the agency, but most of the time you just have an ambiguous statute and you shouldn't read that kind of delegation into it and we just apply the best meaning so you wouldn't overrule Chevron. The other view, somewhat more cynical uh, that I hold, <laughs> is that, you know, remember where Chevron came from. Chevron came from, it, came, it was born out of the victory of Ronald Reagan in 1980 and the decision to radically change the direction of federal regulation of the environment and the economy and transportation and everything else. And so Chevron was a, you know, what was at issue was the Reagan administration, EPA's very substantial reinterpretation of the Clean Air Act in a way that made the regulatory obligations of it much less onerous. And it was struck down on the D.C. Circuit on the ground, well, that was inconsistent not only with prior EPA policy, but with the best reading of the statute. And it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court upheld it on the ground, well, the statute is ambiguous, and therefore the agency has a range of choice. Right? Well, we're in exactly the same kind of historical moment right now that we were in in, in 1980. It's exactly the same. You have, you know, a new administration has come in, it wants to radically reorient the direction of federal administrative action, which is going to require the reinterpretation of the statutes all over the place. And while it may be true that you'll have a five-justice conservative majority on the Supreme Court, you don't have one in the D.C. Circuit, and the Supreme Court can't review every case, and you've got, you've got democratically appointed judges throughout the courts of appeals, you know, Ninth Circuit and other places too, and so people who want to challenge regulations are going to bring the challenges in the D.C. Circuit or the Ninth Circuit. And are you really going to tell these judges, go at it, ladies and gentlemen. Go at it, ladies and gentlemen. You can decide this statute means whatever you want it to mean. I don't, I don't know. I, you know. That's sort of like, uh, that's why we got Chevron in the first place. They're not exactly exercising restraint in the Ninth Circuit uh, without that leeway. Yeah, I just, I just, so I just wonder. You know, I just wonder. I just wonder. And you guys... We've got time for one more. Anybody? No, New York. Anybody in New York? Well, question here. Yeah. Yes. I don't. Can you hear me, or do I should I tell Tom? No, no. Oh, well, we can hear you. So, uh, the, this court has been, you know, relatively receptive to at least some privacy, individual privacy claims, certainly in the Fourth Amendment uh, capacity. 
where would you, what do you think would happen if we had a, a you know, legislature that passed a right to be forgotten type law? Uh, how would it stand in, uh, in this current court? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I have conflicting instincts about it um, in that, you know, I agree with you and, and, and the Chief Justice in particular has been especially sensitive about these Fourth Amendment privacy concerns. Um, of course, in the Fourth Amendment area, you know, one of the things I came to conclude during my time as SG, because, you, know, you know, I watched all the arguments, I saw 90 plus percent of the arguments in that, those five years. Um, is that there's a really simple way to figure out what's going to happen in a Fourth Amendment case, which is if the justices can envision the search happening to them, it violates the Fourth Amendment. Um, I, you can really, I'm, I'm not kidding, line up those cases. They line up perfectly along that axis. Um, and so, but to your point, like the right to be forgotten point, I, I could see the Chief Justice and some of the justices having some sympathy for the privacy right there. On the other hand, it's a highly intrusive regulation of the substantive content of, of expression, or at least of making expression available. And I just think that they're going to be uncomfortable. I would guess at the end of the day, a majority would probably be uncomfortable with that. Um, both because of what it did on its own in terms of its um, uh, speech suppressive effect in the sense of the government sort of in between you and the information and because of what, uh, what upholding a law like that might presage or signal about what's permissible for government to do beyond that. So I guess if I had to bet which way that would come out, I would bet that it would be struck down. So. And on that somewhat happy note, I think, <laughs> um, please join me in, in both thanking Ron for conducting the interview and uh, General Varelli for coming and, and spending so much quality time with us. Well, thank you. It was really a blast. Thanks a lot.